Right, guys, I think we're going to get started there. Um, hello, there's uh, three of you there now. My experience of the closing webinar is that um, we tend to have kind of a, a low attendance anyway. I think webinars aren't everyone's cup of tea. I stick with it because I do think that just having one more touch point in your diary kind of keeps this stuff on the radar and keeps your feet to the fire a little bit. Um, knowing that there might be one more accountability point sometimes can just people give them that little bit of push to kind of keep going with their, their efforts. So um, I do have a bit of content to cover with you today, but it isn't a very long webinar. It's really just to kind of, I suppose, given the nature of our content to refocus you and um, just kind of make sure that this stuff is staying present for you um, as you carry on in your, your busy day-to-day -day lives. So we will go ahead and get started. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items, just so you know. Um, this is being recorded uh, for people who want to reference it later. So if you want to come back to anything, you certainly can. Um, there is a chat function, which um, if you look at that chat function, there's the opportunity to send comments to all panelists and attendees, which is where we've been kind of chatting so far. If there is a specific question that you'd like to just kind of have me articulate or respond to, please put it in that chat function. I, I find that uh, a little bit engaging for myself too. Um, if there is something that's more one-to-one -one that you want to just ask me directly, if you look at that blue bar where it says uh, all panelists and, and attendees, you can choose I am my panelist and that will kind of come just to me uh, and give me a chance to, to respond to you directly. So that's kind of the lay of the land. I suppose in terms of um, what I'm hoping to kind of do is ask a few questions. So I've already asked, have you met with your peer coaches? I'll comment on that in just a second. Um, actually, Michael, any chance that you've met with yours? I got Barry and Albert's response there, but I was just asking, have you had a chance to catch up with your peer coach since our last, um, our last connection point? So if you get a chance, just type it in there. Um, again, as we're going through the content, feel free to jump in and type a comment. It just keeps it a little bit more engaging for me too. And um, so again, you know, it doesn't look like you guys have had a chance since our last session to connect with, with your peer coaches. Um, I'll iterate, the, I'll comment on that in a little bit just because I think it is a really good forum. Whether or not it happens in three or four weeks isn't that important. It's more about having a date set so that even it stays on your radar and you can kick the can if you need to. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, feel free to type in a comment if you can't hear something or all of a sudden, I don't know, video goes dead. Type it into the comments and we'll see if we can sort that out for you. Um, so I suppose a very quick agenda, a little bit around uh, where we left things, um, gauging your progress for your external coaches and peer coaches, thoughts on team reward, uh, where's the focus for driving resilient high performers, and giving you a sense for a couple of resources and next steps, and just really to encourage you to kind of keep at it and your, your kind of learning journey. So that's really what we're hoping to cover in about the next 20 minutes or so. I suppose where we left things last, we talked a lot about that resilience piece. Uh, Declan had done some work on that. We had looked again at your wheel, just kind of referencing that to see how that's all going for you and making sure that kind of some of the topics were connecting to each other. So the whole idea around wellness that John Briffa covered, the focus that Frederica covered, and that kind of bigger picture focus about what's your wheel look like and your balance and how you're owning that. And so I guess <clears throat> what I'd be interested in is um, a bit like the last session, I just said, what's kind of stuck with you? So I'm going to give you just a second, if you don't mind, a couple seconds to respond into the um, group chat there. Is there a particular concept or theme from our last module or from any of the content that you've seen online? Anything that's kind of really sticking with you or is kind of at play with you at the moment? What's, what's kind of on your, on your radar in terms of some of the content we've covered uh, at the moment? So I'm going to leave you to it to just for a second to go ahead and Maybe type up a couple of responses so we have something to comment to. Thanks. So a couple of comments that um, came in there. Barry, I seem to recall even at the session, you were really giving that some thought, that whole area around the formula, um, the focus and well-being equaling resilience. Um, in terms of trying to bring it to life, you know, just I hope that's gone well for you and that you're able to kind of string some of the pieces together. And even maybe in your reflective practice, thinking a little bit about you know, on the days where you apply the wellness, for example, um, whether that's getting good sleep, disengaging from your device, hydration, food, whatever that case is, are you noticing any difference in your overall disposition or attitude towards some of the challenges that you might be facing um, at, 
at work in particular. Uh, I think sometimes the best way to think about that formula is to actually gather evidence for yourself that, yeah, it, it does matter and it changes the way I focus on things and I'm creating a little bit of fun in my environment and I can see a difference in my focus. So it's as important as setting out the actions is to kind of evaluate the evidence that it's showing you. Um, so I think that's a really interesting, um, yeah, just an interesting journey to stay on that kind of exploring the formula. Um, Albert, I remember at the session as well that you were really interested in that, the Gallup framework and the five elements and how that would apply not only to your, I suppose, professional life, um, but also in your, your kind of personal circumstances, which I thought was really nice that you were able to share that. Um, so it's great to see that that's kind of sticking with you and that you've set some actions against it because I think um, a bit like that Nigel Marsh video, you know, where he was kind of going through his work life balance worked really well when he didn't have work. Um, I think days and weeks can slip away and it's very easy for that wheel to get very lopsided and out of balance and it's only when we kind of set I suppose some actionable goals for ourselves against it that it it challenges us to reconsider what our balance and our aspirations in that area are one of the things that I certainly found when I went through my own practice around this was that I probably had some pretty lofty expectations of myself um, in a couple of the areas that as I really started to set goals against them allowed me to challenge my assumptions and were those assumptions and those expectations aspects that I was re that were really important to me and going to help me in my overall resilience or were they things that I thought others wanted of me and trying to separate those out about what's important to me versus what's important um, to others that maybe I need to consider but maybe I just don't need to own all of that. So um, that was a really interesting exercise for me to go through and um, Albert in terms of what you're working on there. And it certainly took me, I, I still work with that wheel quite a lot, but it took me a good solid year uh, before I really was comfortable with where everything was and where I felt I had control over it. So, you know, maybe I wasn't an eight or a nine in everything but I was comfortable with the four or five that I was, and I felt that was the right level of balance for me in some of those areas, given the age of my family, the level of travel I was doing, other priorities that I had on my radar. So it's a nice way to kind of look at, at your life holistically. Um, I find it also is a source of great personal satisfaction because I can go back and go, I'm living the life I intended to live. Um, and I think that's important in my professional life and my personal life. So really interesting there. Thank you for sharing some of those thoughts. I appreciate that. It's always nice to hear what's sticking and what's lasting for people. Um, and then a comment there. Oh, interesting around the whole VUCA and uh, stepping out the importance of well-being in all of that. Um, nice. Uh, nice to let go of some of the, the stress maybe that um, the demand from others is creating and knowing what is your focus what are you out to do? What does that version look like of you? And, and how do you kind of stay focused on that? So really nice uh, lens to use in terms of trying to maintain focus uh, and just making sure that you're interjecting some of that fun and fear in that too, just to keep it stretching it for yourselves. So great to hear. Thank you very much, guys. Um, my challenge really is around then taking this to the, the next level, not the next kind of achievement level, but really the next level of, of, of presence in it and I really think that if you um, if you can reach out and connect with your peer coach um, even if it's to say listen let's connect in three months time let's just put in the diary September's a good time it's after holidays everybody comes back you may need to reschedule it you know a couple of times because when September comes it might get busy but even the the focused event of putting that in I've heard from so many participants just keeps you a little bit present with this stuff. And after the holidays and you come back and you're like, oh, where did we leave all that? And that seems like a million years ago, kind of forces you back into thinking it through for yourself and thinking about where you want to be with it for the next six months. So um, to the extent that you can reach out to those peer coaches and, and try and just use that shared network because we know that that support also kind of contributes to your wellness, your sense of well-being in that community aspect and it helps drive your, your overall resilience. So just a little kind of a nudge from your facilitator to kind of use those tools that are presented to you um, and see how, what you, what you get out of them long-term. So then if we think about um, the next little piece of content that I wanted to share with you. So we talked about the self quite a lot and we talked about 
you know, your wellness and your focus, how you might create some of that for your teams back at work. Uh, and then in the last session with Declan, we talked a little more about creating some of that environment for your teams. And a bit of research that I've come across recently that's really got me thinking um, about focus and what am I focusing on for my teams to create their sense of well-being. So bar sitting down with each of them and doing that wheel, which I'm not exactly sure is my responsibility as a, as a manager or a leader, um, certainly encouraging them to do it for themselves. Um, but even in, in thinking through that, why would I be encouraging them to do that? Why would I be encouraging them to sleep better, to eat better? You know, it could very easily be seen to be outside of my remit and to be a sort of a meddling boss, which is not my intention in this stuff. But as I've mentioned, I think we're often, you know, we want to be judged by our intentions. So my intention is I'm trying to help. And the reality is the experience from the perceiver is her actions are quite pushy or medley. So trying to find that balance for myself has been interesting. Uh, and where I've landed on that is what I'd like to share with you here, which is really around what some of the data and science is telling us around motivation and how we can use that to unlock our team's interests in this area for themselves. So that's really what we're going to talk about very briefly. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the work by Daniel Pink. Um, it's really quite progressive uh, in some of the ways that he's looked at um, gathering data around what's keeping people engaged and motivated. And so historically, um, what we've looked at is the financial drivers and we've used fear and financial reward as the two primary drivers around motivation. Um, but I'm sure that if you're working with teams, particularly of the kind of under 35s group, you're finding that those two motivators, it needs to be much more nuanced than that. Those are far too, um, I suppose, crude uh, instruments to use for motivation now. So what he's really kind of articulated in his book Drive, which I think is an excellent read if you're interested in this sort of area, is really looking at that the drivers of motivation really are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And if you think about fear, fun, and focus, you can start to think about even in those areas how they fit. So, you know, mastery is about being really comfortable enough with what I do with a little bit of, of fear to stretch me. That mastery is also growth. Um, again, with, you know, focus, if I know what I'm about, I'm good at what I do, I'm clear, that purpose is really clear for me. Um, so adding that fun into it kind of makes it stay alive. And the autonomy really relates to that exercise that we did in the room uh, around the manager behavior, the characteristics, the attitude it creates, and the learning or the experience that people have. So really knowing that I'm trusted uh, and that whole psychological safety piece around I'm trusted to do my job and get on with it. Um, what was interesting for me is that none of those are particularly rocket science-y except for the fact that you try and think about the balance of them and how are we having conversations with people? How are we focusing our conversation with our teams around do they feel they have autonomy? Can they give examples of where they have had it or maybe where they felt it infringed and why is that important? Uh, do they feel they have the mastery of their area and are they stretched? And do they feel that they really understand the purpose of what they're doing uh, in terms of that bigger kind of almost the wheel of work uh, type of aspect. So in looking at some of this, uh, I thought some of the aspects that really came out um, for me and that what I've been kind of working with is his layer, uh, Daniel Pink's layer of motivation. And, you know, I'm, I've mentioned to you before in our session that I, I'm a, I, I get, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I'm a fundamental believer that if those don't exist, we sh we're having the wrong conversation, that those, those fundamental you know, basic human needs have to be looked after. And that's really this motivation 1.0. It, humans have to have a base level of uh, survival comforts, is even what I'm calling them, um, you know, food, water, safety, that kind of thing, if we're going to talk about any type of aspect. So if people are feeling as though they're going to get fired any day or there's a huge amount of, you know, uncertainty in the business about it being acquired or merged or redundancies, then this next conversation doesn't really apply. You have to go back to that, that basic level of safety around motivation 1.0. The next layer then is the one that I mentioned about the kind of rather crude instruments of carrot and stick. 
And that's really, you know, that the humans that humans respond to reward and punishment and pursue rewards to avoid threats. Um, I think that is there is an element of truth. I think that as we are gaining a more enlightened workforce, people are starting to realize that, you know, you you can't hurt me. You know, your words can, you know, chink my ego a little bit, but really my fight flight mechanism can just is going to calm down here because I realize that there aren't any real threats. Uh, none of the punishment that can be metered out in a work setting actually can impact me. I get to choose how it impacts me. And so as we create more self-realized uh, and more emotionally intelligent teams, um, we have to realize that that fundamental archaic way of motivating just isn't going to work. They're, they've, they've rationalized and emotionalized past it. So what we're really at is an area that I'm calling motivation 3.0. And it's really looking at that, um, that, in, that connectivity that this industrial revolution is creating and this need for connection. And that it's really in that space of creating, learning, and impacting that people are getting that motivation. So again, a little bit of that fear, fun, and focus aspect. And so I'm starting to realize that more and more that little combination and making sure that I'm referencing it and challenging around that, am I living that? Am I doing that? Am I bringing that? Not just for myself, but how is that manifesting for my teens? I'm actually starting to have conversations around, do you feel stretched and a little bit scared? And how does that make you feel? And why is that good? So I'm actually have a lot of conversations with teams around making sure that they are experiencing some stress. And I know that sounds, you know, contradictory to so much of the stuff that's out there but I think the human system was designed to experience stress and when we try and say to our employees well I don't want you to be stressed I want you to get rid of all that stress what we're actually saying to them is I don't think you can handle it and I think that's the wrong message to be sending I think helping our teams understand that yeah you know this is a little bit scary and it is probably creating some stress and and you know you're able for that stress you can you can dominate and really achieve with that perfect balance because we know the human system wants that little bit of stress it thrives in it it's like john Burke was saying the system needs to be a little bit hungry um the hunger is a natural experience in the body when we said no i don't ever want you to be hungry I don't ever want you to have a little rumble in your tummy what we're saying is what well, you need to be minded you need to take really good care of and you're not able for it when it happens so this motivation 3.0 and the way that it ties into the fear fun and focus in particular are really really interesting to me Another aspect around it is um, the, this, this, what are people contracting for? So historically, you know, we always considered that work was an economic con contract. I give you time and intellect and you give me money in exchange. And I've been in four meetings in the last three days. Uh, they've been kind of project pitches. And in each one, it's just been phenomenal because they are having retention and recruitment issues as one of our core conversation starters. And they all have the same story to tell. You know, we're, we're top quartile payer. We are really generous with bonuses. Uh, and we're, we're having people leave. At, we don't really understand why. And when they've gone to do some of the exit interviews, what's causing people to leave? Um, two of the firms in particular were able to articulate with absolute clarity that people just didn't feel socially connected with their line managers in particular. They didn't feel like they had a relationship there that was going to act as a mentorship and a guide for them for when trickier political situations or career navigation things come up. Um, and I just thought that really fed into the conversation we started this whole course with, that VUCA conversation around um, people are seeing the uncertainty around them and they're trying to decide, what do I need to navigate that? I need a line manager that I trust. I need a line manager who has an interest in me, who's kind of challenging me and pulling me through. And so what that really starts to go around is this more social contract. Um, and that it's not kind of one of our, you know, it's not an add-on. It's, it's, it's really becoming fundamental. And, and if you think about the conversation we had in our session on day one around that VUCA environment and that um, one of the basic fundamental needs is connectivity. And yet we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to substitute device connectivity for human connectivity. And so I think what's happening is it's turning the volume up higher in, in other areas of connectedness and need in those areas. So all this interaction with devices and 
apps that are connecting to our home systems that are connecting to our work systems and all this connectivity it's kind of highlighting a fact that we're missing some human conversation and when the human system is denied something it starts to crave it so it's actually craving that and i think this is really coming through in the way your teams are interacting i think this conversation is particularly relevant if you have remote teams uh, one of the biggest challenges i'm dealing with with two global organizations is you know they're trying to reduce cost on real estate they're trying to uh, minimize office space they want people working remotely they want people to have that autonomy that we saw on the last slide and they want them to stay you know motivated engaged and retained what's missing there is that is that interpersonal connectivity and we're kind of going back to the day i seem to recall there was there used to be a united airlines tv commercial i don't know if it was here in ireland but the tv commercial was um, a boss coming in a room with maybe 50 sales reps and they just lost two big accounts and the boss is standing there and he opens up a briefcase and he starts to pull out airline tickets and he starts to hand them to every single sales associate and says go visit go connect with our clients and our customers we want to keep customers we spend a lot of energy getting them we want to make sure we retain them and keep them you know the, the secret is in the relationship go and so it was you know, obviously an, ad, an advertising for an airline but i think that actually was a, a great um foreseer of what we're having in our employee teams we're telling people go off be remote don't connect it's okay just get your work done sign in every now and again on the instant messaging um, and keep me in the loop but what we're missing is you know you belong here you matter here uh your focus is is also on the relationship in that in that team so i just think it's kind of interesting to make sure that you're balancing that as you're trying to create that high performance environment around resilience that there's a piece around personal connectivity that the evidence and research is showing is really really critical does that resonate with you folks are you are you experiencing it are you seeing any of that with your own teams or you know if you have any suggestions on how you're countering it interested for you to pop them in there um, obviously i'm just kind of sharing my experience based on a client base that i'm dealing with at the minute but wondering if yours is similar or different or if you have any have any other uh ideas to to add in um interestingly enough i was doing speaking for um for the performance mindset a master class for a client a couple weeks ago and one of the women who's the ceo stood up in the group and she said one of the things that she's experiencing is this connectivity and that people even when they do pop into her office finding the time and and not being distracted and being focused and so she's really turned uh, her philosophy into meeting while meeting while walking so she started with uh, performance appraisal conversations only happen in a walk with an employee so the walk, the meeting gets scheduled in the diary preparation is done the employee shows up at the in her office and they leave the office and they go for a walk whether that's around the building whether it's down the block, whether it's back around the park, whatever it is. But she said these meetings while walking are doing a couple of things. They're forcing focus in the conversation. So you're not distracted by phones, your body's in motion, your energy levels are going up, your oxygen levels are higher. It's creating the physical environment for focus in the brain and that wellness aspect to it. So just a kind of an interesting way to think about, oh God, I'm so busy. How do I create these connected moments? Maybe it's doing what you're doing, but just in a slightly different way. So you're probably having performance appraisals with employees. Maybe doing them differently might create a different result. Um, and so just something to try there. So Barry, thanks for popping in. Um, and I think you're right. One engagement plan for all levels, it's just not appropriate. You really need to think about the human being, the individual, as you guys saw yourself. When you start to look at yourself as a human and that wheel, your wheel is going to look very different than someone else's wheel and so even trying to create that you know what are the the pieces of the pie around engagement for an employee and how do you balance those um so really nice nice comments thanks guys appreciate your connectedness with it um <clears throat> i don't have a lot more content to add to that apart from that's just where my thinking is at the minute and that's what i'm working on with some of my clients so i really think that um what I'm trying to share with you is different ways to harness your own energy, to think about creating this environment for your own teams and to continue to challenge yourself to, to splice it down and reapply it again and again and again. Some of the things you try will work, some won't work. 
Um, and again, you know, I think the more you can use those peer coaching pairs to bounce those ideas around, what are you trying? What are you trying? What are you trying? Uh, just to keep the ideas flowing, because I know that you don't have a lot of time to sit down and blue sky think about what are all the things I could possibly do. Sometimes it's just getting one little nugget from someone that you respect who's in a similar circumstance that you can go, that's a good one, man. I'm going to try that. That really gives me something to work on. Um, so just really try and think about how you want to take those relationships going forward, um, whether there was in duo, you know, coaching pairs, or I know there was a triad in the group as well. Um, someone has to push it, you know, and, and I think once it's on the radar, most people tend to go, oh yeah, good idea. Let's get together. So, you know, don't be afraid to be the instigator. Um, Albert, in your instance, maybe that's, you know, you kind of dropping into the guys to say, hey, you know, do we want to get this together? Do we want to try in September to get it on the radar? What else do I think um, I've come across since our program that I'm trying to either incorporate into the next run of the program or trying to incorporate into the general commentary of practice? Two books here I think that would be interesting for you. I know th that we all spend an inordinate amount of time in meetings. And so any hacks that we can come up with to those meetings around using the science, the brain science, um, is, is where I'm kind of doing a little bit of reading on uh, Rogelberg's book here. The, both these books were on the 2019 must read list uh, that was published in January by Forbes. I always find there's kind of two or three on that list that tend to kind of stick out for me. Um, so these are the two that have stuck out for me. Uh, the Surprising Science of Meetings talks a lot about managing energy and focus in meetings. The simple things that we can do to try and um, create different environments in those meetings. So I really would encourage you, it's a very easy read, uh, very accessible, chunked down into nice chapters to be able to access a lot of little hacks and I suppose um, troubleshoot spots. So depending on what your bad habits are in meetings, it gives you a few kind of uh, remedies for them to try. So a great little book to read, uh, maybe something you even buy for your managers who are reporting to you and maybe you know you can have a conversation about adopting one or two of them uh, on a pilot going forward to try and optimize focus in your meetings. The second one is interesting. I'm, I'm not finished with this book yet uh, and I'm, I'm chewing on it if I'm really honest. It's Digital Minimalism. Again, very easy read. Uh, he's minimalistic in his commentary um, and it's really talking about minimizing distraction and minimizing noise. And I know that um, we've touched on it a little bit in some of the topics, but it goes into it much deeper. And I'm actually thinking about ways to bring this content into the next level of the program around kind of just managing distraction um, and how to choose focus in some of that. So I suggest that, you know, if you're someone who kind of feels like it's kind of raining ping pong balls in your brain and you're having trouble with that focus piece, uh, I think there's a few cues in that book that can be pretty valuable. Um, I'm not sure if either are on audiobook yet. They might well be by now. When I bought them on the first week of January, they weren't um, yet, but I know that that was on the cards for both of them. So maybe something to consider if, as you continue your development in this area. Um, I think one of the observations that I have is in the leaders that I've worked with in the last 18 months on this performance mindset piece, <clears throat> excuse me, the ones that seem to be feeling as though they're gaining progress, that they're actually having some level of mastery or comfort or sort of progress are ones that are staying curious about it. So they're spending some of their energy focusing on how to continually focus. I don't think the problem is going to get less. I think it's going to get more in terms of the level of data that we've talked about, the demand, the split attention um, requests that are coming at you. And I think a bit like a really good fitness routine. Um, you need to kind of integrate it. You need to keep exploring it to get to the next level of performance for yourself, to the next level of overcoming boredom, because some of the practices you adopt will become sort of like, okay, I've been doing that for a while. What's new? What's exciting? A bit like a workout routine. There's nothing worse than doing the same workout for 18 months, you know? So I think to the extent you can kind of keep expanding your learning and your curiosity in these areas, I hope that that helps you. It also might be a way for you to connect with those peer coaches again. You know, if one of you finds a resource, an article or video and shares it around and says, let's just get together and talk about how that impacts us or how we can adopt that or what you're trying in that area. I think some of those little prompts can be really valuable. Again, go back to some of the online content and just a reminder that you're going to be locked out of that in a few weeks. 
the platform content, content. So I know a few of you have taken the step of kind of going in and downloading everything. My suggestion is just do that. Spend, mark out half an hour, pull the content um, because you just might not know when you want to reference it again or maybe take your team through some mini master classes or things like that. Um, so I hope that that's been helpful. I'm not going to take up much more of your time unless there are any specific questions that you have. Happy to entertain those and really do appreciate the comments there around integrating, particularly around integrating some of this into you know, your team's work plan. So how are they addressing it? How are they looking at it? And being willing to share some of the resources maybe to help them think about how to think about this topic as it relates to them. So anything on that learning platform, download it, share it with your teams if you think it's gonna spark an interesting conversation around helping them manage some of this in their own environment, in their own kind of fear, fun, and focus and world. Um, so friends, that's what I have for you. You like that curious about staying focused within teams. Good, thanks. Thanks for the feedback, guys. I really appreciate your participation today and for being quite engaged in a, in a forum that isn't always easy to do that. So I wish you well. Uh, please keep in touch. I, I really am genuinely interested in hearing how this is coming about for your teams, what's coming to life. I might use your stories for participants to come. Um, so I really appreciate all of that. I'm going to bid you farewell and wish you a good, gray, rainy day. I hope that, the, that, the, that your mood is better than the weather. And I'll say goodbye now. Take care. All the best.